Starting off, we have one of the tools recommended by one of you from the comments telling me to try it out, and I've been actually using it ever since. Atween is a better way to search your shell command history, and it comes with features and does not really sacrifice anything. To install, you can either use Cargo or Homebrew, whichever you prefer. For my case, I just went with Homebrew. After installing, make sure you add the path to your RC file according to the shell that you're using, or else you might run into some issues. In my case, I'm using Z shell. By default, Atween triggers when you hit the up arrow key. Eventually, I found the up arrow key getting in my way. Not sure if there is any other way to do this or to turn this up arrow key off. So I went into my RC file, unbind the keys, and then remap the keys as you see here to control R. With that out of the way, I can now use the classic control R to open up my command shell history, then just use the arrow keys to navigate up and down. Control N and control P also works here as well. It has different command modes, like when I hit control R again, I'm switching from global to the host and to session to the directory ones and then back to global. You can hit tab on a command to autocomplete the command. Hitting enter on a command just directly runs the command. I can essentially just search for the commands, like maybe you have some docker command that you need to run. When it comes to the searching filter, you actually have three options that you can switch from by hitting control S. The default search mode is fuzzy search, but you can also search by prefix or search by full text if you prefer that. You're also able to just yank a command that you ran before directly from here by hitting control Y. And now that annoyingly hard command is in your clipboard. You can hit Ctrl O on a command to basically inspect it as well. And it also allows you to delete the command from history by hitting Ctrl D. All of this is basically configurable in the Arduin config file. And I'll leave the link to the docs down below so you can go and tinker with it. In my config file, I essentially have my search mode just set to default as fuzzy. There is a few more settings that you can change, like for example, enter to accept. Basically, enter to directly run the command. And for the key map mode, which I currently have it set to Emacs, but then you can choose between VI or Emacs. Can I come in a sec? Are you VI or Emacs? What? I'm sorry, what's Vmax? Vmax, 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 Emax? So you have options like Vim normal or Vim insert. And then finally, I just have my style set to compact, my inline height set to 20, and invert set to true, which is like the inverse of my search bar. And those are just some of the settings that I've changed. It even has this sync option to basically sync your shell history across machines fully encrypted using its server, or you can actually just self-host your own server as well, but that topic deserves its own video. Next up is Branchlet. This has become one of my favorite tools to manage my Git work tree branches directly in the terminal. It is fairly simple to use and can save you a lot of time, and I personally love using Git work trees, so this tool has been extremely useful. I hate to say it, but the only way to install it is using npm. Chatbot. Hopping into a git repository, when we first run the branchlet command, it will prompt us with the following options, like create work tree, list work tree, delete work tree, settings, and exit. Creating a work tree is as easy as entering the directory name for that work tree. It then prompts us to choose the source of the branch we want to create that work tree from. Once we select the source, it will ask us to enter the name for the new branch, which is typical of how git work tree works. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it a branch name. Then for confirmation, we can just go ahead and select yes and the work tree has been created. Coming down to list work trees, we can then check the work trees that we have in this repository. Hitting escape just takes us back. I think you can see why this is such a great tool if you work with git work trees. To delete a work tree, we can simply navigate to delete work tree and go to the one that you want to delete. Hit enter and it should prompt you to delete that work tree. But keep in mind though that this only deletes the work tree branches and not the actual branches that you create for those work trees. If I list my git branches, you'll actually see that we still have the backend rework branch created over here, but the work tree itself has already been deleted. If you want to remove the whole thing, you would have to remove the branch itself later on as well. But again, this can easily be fixed by going into the branchlet config 
and changing the delete branch with worktree to true. You can also run branchlet with these flags directly instead of going through the options. Looking at the settings for branchlet, you can actually access the settings.json file directly from within here because it does tell you where the configuration file is located at. You can change your patterns, the things you want to ignore, the path templates, and so on. Overall, it's a great tool to manage Git work trees directly from the terminal. This next one is called Superfile, and it is a great refresh to a terminal-based file manager. You can install it with a bash script or just use Homebrew if you're on macOS. Running SPF opens up Superfile. Superfile supports the general Vim navigation for files like JNK, Enter to go into a directory, F to toggle the preview of a directory, and for me, I have dash bind it to return to previous directories. You can hit shift forward slash to look at the key bindings, but you can again change this in the key bindings configuration of Superfile. You can obviously create a file right from in here or create a directory by adding the forward slash at the end. You can go ahead and delete the directories and confirm the deletion. You can switch to the different file panels as you can see here and navigate through the base file directories of your system. You could also pin the current directory that you're on into the pinned section. The basic stuff of opening tabs into a new directory, things like that. It's another great alternative for a terminal based file manager. And I've already covered about Superfile in detail. If you're interested, you can definitely go and check out that video. And I've also seen people in the comments asking me if I have tried Yahtzee before. But here's the thing though, I'm like, I'm not here to say which one is better than the other. Like I'm beyond that point. This was built by a high school student, I think. And there was definitely passion that was put through this as an open source project. And that itself to me has so much value and meaning and I don't really care about two to three second differences in speed anymore. I tend to use things because it has an inspiring story behind it. So to all the people that is like, Yahtzee is faster, this is faster, that is slower. Like, I don't have time for that in my life anymore. Next is a tool for people who love terminals and have to work with a lot of colors. Pastel is a no brainer. For Mac, you can use Brew to install it. If you're on Linux, you can just use Pac-Man. Now there is a lot of ways to use Pastel, so I'm going to try and show you some of the examples on how I use Pastel and maybe you can go and implement them in your own workflow. So essentially we have a bunch of flags that work with Pastel, flags that are necessary for Pastel to work properly. So the list flag basically lists all the colors that you can access via pastel. So there is a lot of colors here. And for example, if I just go ahead and yank this medium spring green color, and then I use the color flag with this color, we then end up getting the hex values RGB or HSL for that color at the same time showing which color it is most similar to. We can also pass in the value as a direct hex number as a string. So for example, if I go ahead and pick this color and then it should give us the RGB, HSL and hex itself as well, of course, and the color that it's most similar to. The pick flag is also one of my favorites to use because I can essentially just run the pastel pick and depending on your system, you're gonna be able to choose the colors from here. And yeah, just select the colors you want, hit okay, and it should print out the values for those colors. Let's say we want to format a hex value color to RGB, just add the format with the RGB flag, then add the hex color value as a string, and then you'll get the RGB values. There is also the gradient flag, which allows us to essentially bring out the gradients of those colors depending on the number of steps we provide. So let's change that to red. We're going to go ahead and add these steps. So for example, we only want about four steps. So that would be N4. And so we get about four different gradients starting from red. The higher steps you go, the more detail you're going to get from those gradients. So here we did like nine steps. You could also add the flags. Like for example, if you want these nine steps of gradient to be like RGB based colors, or let's say the gradient of HSL, you can go ahead and change that as well. If you like, I think the default is RGB. I'm not sure about that though. 
You can also pass in like the random flag and then pipe it to pastel mix flag and then that will give out the mix of random colors like say green and then we get a mixture of green here. So yeah, an amazing tool for working with colors inside your terminal. The next one we have is Taproom or I don't even know how you read it. Maybe it's Taproom, I don't know, but this is basically a homebrew package manager inside your terminal. So Linux users, feel free to skip this to the next one. Mac users though, you might wanna hear about Taproom or Taproom. So obviously we're gonna use Homebrew to install this. Taproom lets you search through your Homebrew packages that you can install or search for the currently installed packages and check if your packages are up to date or not. And then you can update them directly from within here. Like here, we can look at the details of each of the packages and look at the versions, the home page, or like the install status, the conflicts with other packages. Whether it's a homebrew cask or not a cask, you can search through all of it here. And you can also see the key bindings right below this section to navigate and search your way through this homebrew package manager. Hitting F allows us to jump to the non-cast versions of the brew packages. If I hit O, it brings us to the outdated packages. Hitting E takes us to the section where we have explicitly installed those packages. Things like brew cask or brew tap. I can also search my packages by hitting slash and then look for that package showing the version, the install type, the size of those packages. Hitting tab will just navigate you between different panels that you can see here. If we hit update for the cask that is outdated, we can actually see it installing the new packages. You can also upgrade them one at a time as well by just hitting U instead of capital U. It also tells you what version you're going to be upgrading from. Yeah, a really great tool for managing homebrew packages. There's a lot of filters you can change and look at, navigate through them all, see the versions when you installed them, outdated ones, and so on. Next, we have Navi, and Navi is a terminal application that executes one-liner from Cheat Sheets. It's basically an interactive sheet sheet tool for the command line. For this, you can just go ahead and use Homebrew to install it, or you can use Pac-Man as well if you're on Linux. Before we go into how Navi works, we're gonna jump into where the Navi config path is, and you can check this by doing Navi info config path. For the cheat sheets, you actually need to have a path for that as well. It's almost like a script for Navi. So Navi info cheats path to check for the path of your cheat sheets. Jumping into the navi config.yaml, there isn't a lot that is going on here. So we have the different type of styles, tag, comment, snippet, the finder like FZF. If we try to run navi, we'll actually see a bunch of cheat sheets. These are all the cheat sheets that are from the navi cheats directory. And so you can directly download them from navi github or write up your own cheat sheets inside the cheats config. For example, if we look at pastel, we have list of commands for pastel. It tells us what this command does and shows us an example of how to use that command. We can directly run a single command from Navi as well. Very similar to how Arduin works, but it's a little bit different in a sense where you can run your script from Navi. So let's say we go and jump into our cheats config and see how this works. As you can see, we have a bunch of cheat sheets in here. Some of them were downloaded directly from the Navi GitHub repo. And inside a cheat file, it is basically just different types of script in a dot sheet format. And then Navi reads them out. Like for example, I have this macOS doc that I can toggle on and off. And I'm already on macOS Tahoe, so the doc, I can confirm that it works, but I was trying to do this for the menu bar as well, but I think they changed some things. I haven't figured out that part yet. But anyways, let's try to run this macOS doc. So just like that, we can sort of run our script through Navi. And again, I'm just gonna go ahead and toggle it off. So yeah, those are some of the examples. So you can really imagine creating your own cheat sheets for your own type of workflow. The next tool we have is Tildeer. And Tildeer is a simple community-driven man page. It's great for looking at short example on how to use different type of commands. And I find it helps saves a lot of time from having to read the whole man page itself because it really only brings out the most common and most important commands that you should probably know. For this one, I'm going to install it with cargo install tildeer. 
we can call tldr by running tldr in our shell. And just like everything we talked about in this video, most of the tools have their own config file and you can check the tldr's path using the show path flag. Quickly jumping into tldr, I actually haven't changed anything much in my config except for the compact and use pager. If we, for example, try to use tldr now, we can do something like tldr and pass git. It pulls up the most important commands for git. If I go ahead and change compact to false, this is how it usually is by default. I don't prefer that because my texts are pretty zoomed in on my terminal. I find TLDR really easy to use and it really brings me what I want to know about a command really quickly. Like for example, if we look at curl here, similar to Navi in terms of learning how to use a command, but at the same time, it's not really the same. Yeah, TLDR, absolutely amazing. If you're still learning commands in a terminal or if you forgot about a command and just want a quick glance to how the command is used, then this is probably the best way to do it. If you're on Linux by default, I think tldr, the tldr config file is actually located in .config. But if you're on Mac and you happen to install it with brew, just brew uninstall tldr and install it with cargo. This way you have more freedom to adjust your config path. If you want tldr to read from the configurations that you created inside your .config, then you need to make sure to add the config path into your RC file as well. Before this, we already talked about the brew package manager. Now we're going to take a look at the cargo crates manager, which you can simply install with cargo. When you first open up cargo seek, you actually see absolutely nothing. But when you hit enter, it then fetches every single cargo crate available for you to download. And it gives you the same information about a package like the version, what is the latest version of it, when was it created, when was it last updated, the documentation page, the repository page. Like for example, if I look for tilde here and the letter I in front of it are the ones that are installed. Hitting control S brings up a sorting menu where you can just look for, for example, recent downloads. Hitting control A brings up a search filter so we can search for the installed ones, enter, and we can see the ones that we have installed on our system. Then you can see the general keybinds on the right side here, I for install, U for uninstalling, A to add, or R to remove a project, Control D to open the docs, everything you need is on the right side. And that is Cargo Seek. Then we have a few more, which are just like fun little things you can do in your terminal. We have Stormy, which is basically a quick weather API inside your terminal. In the Stormy config, you can go ahead and change your location and then it will just pull the data for those locations right into your terminal. The installation is pretty easy. You can just go to the GitHub, use go install and you should be good to go. This next one is a tool that lets you read stuff inside your terminal, such as PDF files or ebook files. It supports some Vimotions, so that's good. I don't really know what you call it because I can't read that and you can install it with Cargo. It's pretty easy to use. Just go to your directory where you have your files at and then just open it up. And then you'll see this UI where everything is just in the center. J and K works fine. Control D, Control C to go up and down works. You can search for different chapters or search for different words using slash just like in Vim, but it's not it's not super perfect. I mean, there are some misalignments. Yeah, as you can see here, the formatting is a bit off, but that's probably just my PDF. Finally, we have Smash, which is basically a monkey type inside your terminal. You can install it with pip install or use yay. This is basically like almost a monkey type clone in your terminal. And it's great because you can literally open it up anytime from your terminal and it works. I don't even think you need an internet for this. And yeah, as you can see, we have different types of themes you can choose from. You can head to the settings, change everything around here, how difficult you want it to be or whatever your preference is. You can change the way your cursor looks. You can go to the help section and look at the keybinds that they have as well. And yeah, that is pretty much it. I hope you guys have fun smashing your keyboard and I'm out.